This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making for Canadians. We are hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore. So episode 102, another yes. phenomenal guest. We've had such a great streak of guests, and this one was another, I think, another great one. Yeah, it's a really good discussion. It, it was a... a Casual is not the right word, just an, a, a, a natural discussion about a lot of things that are really uh, important to to investors. So his name is Dr. Brian Portnoy. Uh, I met Brian at a conference last fall when I was in, in Scottsdale, Arizona, and, and, and met him kind of casually, oddly enough. He was at the conference, but we met at a restaurant after the conference and and just kind of connected. I looked at him up. I knew him from the kind of the fin Fin Twit world. I've followed him for a while and I hadn't read his book yet. So I picked up his latest book, The Geometry of Wealth. And what a phenomenal, phenomenal book. And I, I don't think there's anyone better than Brian to kind of tell that story based on his career of, you know, having, you know, a PhD from Chicago in international politics and economics. And then he got into the hedge fund world. He worked at Morningstar for a long time. So he's very credentialed in the financial space. He's also got this interesting academic quasi psychological background, but he's got this neat mix that he brings to, to where he is now. Yeah. And he's, he's no joke from a, I don't know what you'd call it. Pedigree background, uh, formal training, maybe uh, education. He's got a PhD from the university of Chicago, CFA charter holder. Um, so yeah, I mean, as many of our guests have been, he's a, he's a pretty serious, pretty serious guy from an academic perspective. But really nice. You're, you're right. The conversation was so natural. We just kind of connected, hit it off. We're on a, you know, a similar mission to help people. So I, I, I thought it was just terrific. He's a good, good person and great. I love the book. I can't say enough about the book. Yeah. So impactful how he's taken a world that's so complicated and synthesized it down to such simple mental model that he kept talking about of how to look at this whole, you know, decision of how to decide what's important to you and how to manage your money around that. Yeah. It's the whole decision-making process and the big decisions that all the smaller decisions stem from. But I think the one of the main big picture points is, is the difference between being wealthy, which he gives his definition of wealth and being rich that's that was one of my main takeaways, and I, I thought I mean that's basically the whole conversation is about that difference. So he's written two books. Uh, one is the Investor's Paradox, which is his first book. The second one, as I mentioned, is the Geometry of Wealth. Um, if you listen to, he was on a podcast with our, our good friend Ted Sides, and he talks about you know his journey to write the first book and how he thinks in hindsight he may have written them in reverse order, but he couldn't have because he wasn't at the stage in his career to appreciate what's in the second book. So if you enjoy this um, interview, I highly recommend you go listen to him with, with Ted on, on Ted Saidi's podcast, Capital Allocators. All right, should we go to the interview? There we go. Enjoy our conversation with Dr. Brian Portnoy. Brian Portnoy, welcome to the Rational Reminder podcast. Happy to be here. We're happy to have you. So I want to start with a question about your most recent book. Uh, at the beginning of the book, you compare money to Lord Voldemort, which probably sounds like a funny comparison to a lot of people, uh, but you explain it as feared by most and mentioned by few. What do you think it is that gives money this status? I, I think money is much more of an emotional lightning rod than people give it credit for, that people really think about. Uh, I think many of us in grade school are or when we were young, we're taught that money is merely a, a means of exchange or a store of value or a unit of account. But um, that's not really what's relevant when we think about having success um, financially. Um, money uh, captures many of the things in life that we grapple with, hope, joy, fear, regret, envy. And as a result, um, and this is based on surveys from psychologists um, and, and other researchers, it, it's really the topic 
that we like to discuss the least compared to marriage and relationships, politics, uh, religion, mortality. Money typically ranks in these surveys as the most uncomfortable topic. And it's really because it's, it, it, it touches uh, onto our emotions somewhat deeply. How do you reconcile, like just based on what you just said, how, how, is money, how does money touch on our emotions more than talking about our mortality? I, I can't answer what the, the relative comparison is, but the thing about money is that it's so wide ranging as an experience. We make dozens or more financial decisions every day, little, little things, so every now and then a, 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 a big decision. And so I, I don't think we um, sit around most of the time thinking about death. Um, it's, a, it's a heavy topic. Um, lots of movies and books uh, deal with that. And, and certainly we all give some thought to um, sort of the beginning and end of things. But, you know, uh, money comes up so many times a day, every day for our entire lives. And, and because it does trigger uh, things like fear, regret, envy, um, it's just something that has led it to be uh, an uncomfortable area. Right. Yeah. So your book, Geometry of Wealth, which I absolutely loved, had a line in it, a phrase in it called funded contentment. Can you describe, like you did in your book, mm -hmm. how funded contentment compares to being rich? I, I establish a fork in the road that I think it's important for people who think about having uh, a healthy relationship with money and, and want to achieve financial wellness. And that fork is between being rich and, and, and being wealthy. Um, we tend to think of money in quantitative terms, you know, back to Ben's questions about sort of uh, emotions and, and, and why is it such a, a, a triggering topic. Um, we're, we're, we're thought to take, think of it, taught to think of it quantitatively, but it's very much a qualitative experience. So we think about accumulating more money and the things that, that money buys. And perhaps something we can talk about is, is an important observation or finding from the social psychology literature, which is that the accumulation of more doesn't necessarily make us as happy as we're, we think we're going to be. And so what I wanted to do in this project and, and how I sort of developed my thoughts was distinguish that quest for more with the achievement of what's really important to you. And so I define true wealth as the ability to underwrite a meaningful life. Now that's a deliberately loaded phrase and we can talk about what's a meaningful life and what does it mean to underwrite that life. Uh, this phrase funded contentment hopefully focuses people on the idea that let's think about what makes for a contented, joyful, meaningful, purposeful life. And then recognize that money is an absolutely unavoidable topic on a day-to-day -day basis. And we should think constructively. It's not always comfortable, but we should try to think constructively about we, how we go ahead and fund that contentment and maybe divert our attention a little bit. It can't be perfect and it won't be 100% all the way, but divert our attention from that quest to be rich, which is the equivalent to a quest for more, which is ultimately quite unsatisfying. I think the term to describe that, correct me if I'm wrong, is the hedonic treadmill. Is that right? That's right. I, I, I speak to lots of audiences, and, and one of my slides um, is nothing but uh, the picture of a treadmill. <laughs> and the idea is that no matter how fast you sprint on a treadmill, you, you're not going to get any further than you are right now. And that, I think, is an apt um, image for the way that you know we live in you know what is very much a, a, a consumer based society where we're very uh, attuned to getting the next thing but also more broadly and it's not a bad thing to be goals oriented but we are goals oriented uh we probably under theorize what it means to have a goal and what's involved with accomplishing that goal um and suffice it to say for now um goals are less, in some ways, less important than people make them out to be. Interesting. So the title of the book, uh, the, the Geometry of Wealth, is based on three shapes. The, the circle, the triangle, and the square. 
And in the book, you use those shapes to describe the journey to achieving wealth, kind of like what you're just talking about. Can you describe what that journey looks like and how you relate it back to the shapes? Yeah, the idea for the shapes was to acknowledge that um, we're being respectful of others when we try to simplify a, a complex situation and that even in finance, which is so dominated by numbers, that maybe we can use clearly stated words and even pictures and basic shapes to capture what's important. Um, I, I've been influenced by people like Carl Richards and, and others who have really brought illustration to the, the front of the industry. The brain processes images about 60,000 times faster than words. And um, it's not a bad thing. Um, it, it's not juvenile or sophomoric to capture complex ideas through simple drawings. So that's the premise behind just coming up with shapes to capture our path toward true wealth. What the circle, triangle, and square represent is sort of what I think is a three-step process for ach achieving funded contentment. Number one, we, um, uh, we uh, uh, define our purpose. Um, at any moment in time, and it's a circle because we're never done figuring that out, but you know, we, we spend some time thinking about what's a meaningful life. Secondly, uh, we set priorities, uh, both financial and otherwise, and I think there's sort of a right and a wrong way to think about priority setting and goal setting. And then third, the square, um, we make decisions um, across all um, dimensions of money life, not just investing, but saving, spending, insuring, giving, and, and, and so forth. It's an iterated journey. That's what the circle represents. Um, the triangle, three shapes. I think there's three broad priorities that should be kind of thought about in a particular order. And the square with its four sides, you know, is a, you know, sort of a simple mental model of thinking about um, markets specifically and how we set appropriate expectations for what our money can do for us. So I wanted to put something on the cover of the book that is the argument. So circle, triangle, square, purpose, priorities, decisions, that is the argument of the book. Um, the rest is detail. I don't, I don't want you to give the book away here, but do you think you can touch on the, uh, the, uh, the points of the triangle and the corners of the square? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the point was to give it away. I mean, um, you know, I guess there's a difference between ingredients and the recipe, um, but the ingredients are there on the box, uh, plain to see. You know, when it comes to setting priorities, and this is a you know, broad ob observation, I, I think we as human beings uh, who have a, an instinct for growth and to thrive do think very naturally about more, accumulating more, achieving goals. But one thing we know as human beings from an anthropological point of view, but something we also know in the more narrow context of investing is that those who think about risk first tend to do better. So survive before you thrive. And when I think about my investment heroes, Charlie Munger, Howard Marks, people like that, um, they write in their own way about what I call being less wrong. So um, we very much in all elements of our life, um, especially competitive people in, in, in Canada and the U.S., we want to be more right all the time. We want to be faster, better, smarter, richer, and so forth. I think it's critically important to invert that a little bit and say, well, why don't we first think about what could go wrong here? And I'm not talking a, 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 in the very narrow sense of buying you know, fire insurance for your home, which you probably should have, but more broadly, what are the regrets in life that you would prefer not to have and how do you manage those first? So the triangle was built on kind of a stack of three things that I call protect, match, and reach. So triangle, three things. Uh, protect is being less wrong, thinking about risk before return and, and having that smartly calibrated. The second level um, uh, is match meaning that we want to have a balance in our life between assets and liabilities, uh, not just financially, but, but, but psychologically. And, and if we can kind of protect ourselves against bad things that could happen, and if we have that balance in our life um, uh, between uh, assets and liabilities uh, on multiple levels, then there's that third level of reach which is, you know, you've sort of achieved funded contentment to some extent, at least for a moment in time. 
And, and there's so many wonderful aspirational things we could do that are part of a joyful life. You, you're in a very good position to do that if you could get through the first two stages. Really interesting. What happens if people skip one of these um, images? And is there an area that many people do skip over? I, I th yes, um, yes and yes. Um, the, the, uh, stepping back and just a comment on the financial advice business over the last half century, but especially over the last 10, 10 or 20 years, um, the, the industry has moved toward um, so-called uh, goals-based uh, wealth management, meaning that we're going to go beyond just the buying and selling of securities and we're going to articulate your goals and then build a portfolio that's you know calibrated to your time horizons your risk tolerance and and all of that you know important you know all of those important considerations for that's fine in and of itself but for me i think what's missing in many conversations uh, between husband and wife, between advisor and client, between parent and child, is recognizing that we need to calibrate purpose and planning, and that you have to have both sort of a clear mind and dirty hands. It's, it's one thing in this process to say, you know, I, I want to think about what a, a meaningful life is to me. I, I want to, you know, support my family or my community, or uh, this, is, this is what I aspire to do. But it, unless you have embedded that in a robust financial plan. It's probably just a lot of talk and it's not, it's, it's not that it's not valuable, but it might not lead you to anything. The, the flip side is to have a plan without recognizing what the purpose is. I mentioned, you know, toward the start that the whole concept of goals is problematic. It, 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 the thing about goals, whether it be the new home, um, your, your child getting into university, uh, the big goal is of course retirement. Um, a lot of times when we achieve those goals, the, the, the happiness that we think we're going to feel might not be there at all. And if it is, the intensity and duration of that happiness is, is not particularly deep or long. I think if we can, uh, in a step prior to uh, uh, goals, think about, well, what are the deeper sources of meaning that I'm trying to achieve here? We create a bedrock for those ephemeral goals that creates a much more robust financial planning process. Do you have a sense, and it, it may speak to the question that you just talked about uh, as it relates to the financial industry, but do, do you have a sense for how most people are doing on this journey to wealth as you've described it? Well, you know, here in America, at least, we've got 330 million people and, and things are a little bit nutty. Um, I would say generally people are in terrible shape. Um, uh, you know, there's different levels of financial wellness um, in terms of just getting by and paying the bills and, and having some emergency savings before you can even get to a place where you can establish and invest and save uh, to, to achieve your goals. And beyond that, really think about this broader notion of of funded contentment, you know, the something like a, a half, somewhere between 40 and 50% of American adults don't have $400 um, to, to, to spend in an emergency. Um, and lately, uh, we've been in an emergency. So this notion of financial fragility, unfortunately, is, is front and center uh, uh, in the US and in many uh, parts of the world. Um, as it relates to people who can pay the bills, who have a roof over their house that, that, that doesn't leak. The thing is, the, the benchmark isn't visible because the benchmark is everybody's own life. I, I think one of the challenges that advisors and clients have, uh, but we all have as individuals and individual investors, is that we will think about some global stock index as being the benchmark for success. And um, there's been progress in um, the advice business, but not as much as I think we need to move people away from saying, did I beat the market as distinct from have I achieved my goals? Now, um, you know, JP Morgan, the original JP Morgan, you know, famously said, whatever, 100 years ago, that nothing corrupts your financial judgment more than the sight of your neighbor getting rich. Like, we, we, are, we are social primates. We... Um, 
we're looking around, we're competitive, we, we want to know what others are doing, and, and we do want to win. What I try to do with the concept of funded contentment and, and the mental models that I've built around that is to hopefully encourage people to focus on what they can control. And, and what they can control is how they articulate the life that they want to lead and then some of the specific financial decisions that go into it. I do just want to touch on something that uh, we, we were talking about with the shapes. Uh, you, you talked about the points of the triangle. Can, can mm -hmm. you touch on the, the, the corners of the square before we continue? Oh yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, the square is um, uh, focused on setting investment expectations. So, you know, um, a lot of, you know, even if we're talking about broader purpose and meaning and some of that squishy stuff, and even if we expand the conversation to saving and spending and, and, and ensuring, you know, the, the, the core of most financial plans is a portfolio. And then the question becomes, well, how do you make good decisions to build the portfolio that's right for you? Um, I spent a good part of 20 years uh, doing investment due diligence, running portfolios, spent a fair amount of time in the hedge fund industry. So, you know, I've sort of been at the deep end of the pool in terms of complexity. And so the, the square is just one way that I have tried to cut through the unbelievable noise and complexity of all things in investments and say, there's only a few things that you really need uh, to be thinking about to figure out whether uh, your portfolio and the pieces that comprise your portfolio will live up to expectations. Because, and I, I, I wrote an earlier book a number of years ago called The Investor's Paradox. The, the whole point of that book was that a successful investment is one that meets your expectations. And um, as opposed to beats the market um, or beats your neighbor's uh, portfolio or, or anything like that. So what, what, what do we want to know? Um, we we want to know uh, four things. We want to know what the growth potential is, so re return expectations. Um, we're wired to love point estimates. We want to know that something can make 9% a year. The, the, the problem with the world is it doesn't work that way. Uh, and so we can think about ranges of outcomes um, in terms of growth potential. We want to understand the pain of owning that investment um, in, you know, finance speak, we call that volatility and, and lots of other even more confusing words. But, you know, the, the idea is that when things go down, value investors should say, oh, great, it's cheaper. I can buy, you know, a dollar for 50 cents. Uh, what happens in point of fact is that when things go down, people tend to sell. And so as a community of investors globally, we buy high and sell low, which is do the, the, the opposite. Um, the third uh, piece is um, uh, fit. So, you know, where where does um, this fit into a uh, portfolio? Um, uh, which is sometimes hard to assess because, you know, again, go, going into the into finance world, we have these you know notions of correlation and, and portfolio theory is built uh, on the the basic but profound notion that. Um, uh, a, a series of assets that have um, a low correlation with each other will build a more a, a efficient portfolio. But again, we're we're looking for um, you know we're we're, we're looking for uh, point estimates um, in 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 that discussion of fit. When in in point of fact, um, it doesn't work that way. We need, we need to have ranges. Like we think generally, stocks and bonds are lowly correlated. The fact is sometimes they are highly correlated to each other and sometimes they're negatively correlated to each other. Again, keep in mind the thread here is managing expectations. And then finally, very quickly, uh, the fourth corner uh, of the square, the fourth way to manage expectations. Um, in, in finance speak, um, we might call it liquidity for real people. Uh, we can just say, well, what's the cost of changing your mind? Uh, so you, 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 you buy a stock or a bond or a structured product or real estate, or you buy into a venture capital offering, Wh whatever the case may be. If you buy an ETF or a mutual fund every single day, you can buy and sell that thing. So the cost of ch changing your mind is very low, but it also means that you can demonstrate terrible behavior every day. If you buy into a private equity fund with a 10 year life, 
the cost of changing your mind is very, very high. Uh, and so you want to have a little <laughs> bit more confidence about what that is. Um, but at the same time, you um, are saving yourself from yourself in terms of feeling compelled to sell when something isn't going poorly. What was when something is going poorly? Very interesting. interesting. Let's go back to the financial wellness part. I'm mm-hmm. curious what you think the impact of, and so many of us have lived through these crises. So the financial crisis of 2008, and then this year's uh, pandemic. What is the impact on people's financial wellness, do you think? Um, let, let me un- answer that in two ways. One, very straightforward. One, kind of maybe a more highfalutin concept about time and temporality. Uh, the, the, first, the, the first impact is, is obvious, which is that millions of people have uh, lost jobs that they couldn't afford to lose. And, you know, we've already globally seen... Uh, you know, changes in global wealth inequality, and and this will probably accelerate that. So as we alluded to before, there are many financially fragile people, and now there are probably more. Um, So, you know, financial wellness, you know, begins at the bottom floor with just being able to, you know, have a a roof over your head and food on the table and make sure that your family's safe. Unfortunately, we we might have taken a step back. So for those of us who... um, uh, you know, thankfully, don't need to worry about the opportunity to be charitable, to 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 give to others, to think about others. It, it it's it hasn't been this high in a long time um, because people people do need help. The the second, a little bit more conceptual answer to the question is based on the fact that humans have a very unique um, sense of time and temporality. It's a it's a deep topic that I ha- have a lot of fun with. Won't go into really too much, but suffice it to say that the human flexibility with the ability to, to, to imagine the future, to remember the past and to, and to be present is, is quite unique. And, and, and so, um, uh, you know, I, I, I like to say that we are, you know, sort of t- time travelers uh, of a sort, although we never got the manual. So our brains are zipping around. There's actually tons of fascinating research now in, in neuroscience, neuropsychology about, what the future self is all about and our ability to think forward as to who we want to be in the future on the context in the context of the crisis that's happening right now what happens in a crisis is that that ability to look longer term collapses and so you know we've all either unfortunately experienced or know of others experiences when they're in an automobile accident and it's a little bit strange how the brain seems to have uh, almost like a photographic memory of that accident. And why is that? It's because the brain goes into hyperdrive. And if you think about just a camera, um, you know, shutter going off, you know, every fraction of a millisecond, we're taking a, a million pictures of what's going on. And so we have that vivid, vivid recollection. Fortunately, we're not in that scenario um, much at all. Ho- ho- hopefully never. When we think about a crisis, what happens is that time collapses, and we have um, uh, we 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 feel the need to take care of ourselves and our loved ones here and now, as we should. Remember, our very first instinct, going back hundreds of thousands of years, is survival. You can't thrive unless you survive. And when that danger trigger uh, deep in your brain goes off, you know what you got to do. That fight, flight, or freeze mentality. It's there. It's hardwired. It's not going anywhere. It's always on. Um, it's it's an important part in the you know in, in in our brains that that's not going anywhere. What's important, just to tie a bow around temporality, which I can sometimes talk too much about, is that we want to be prepared ahead of time for when these crises happen and our horizons collapse. And this is where the help of others or just having a plan generally. So if you have something on paper where you yourself or your partner or your parent or your child or your advisor or a friend can say, wait a minute, we have a plan. We, we've talked about where we want to be in six months, six years, 26 years, and we are physically in pain now because that fear is physically painful. Um, even if it's low grade, um, it, it, it creates anxiety. It has physical consequences. 
we were calm and, and focused on the long term at some point in the past. Let's revisit what we said then. And we almost with like a crowbar and a door that's hard to open, we can then expand our time horizons out. But the challenge in any crisis, uh, including this one, is that we are focused on the here and now and all of your best laid plans can easily go out the window unless you in some way through your own discipline or through the help of others can stay on track. Is there a way for someone to know if they're more susceptible to this time collapse before it happens? Uh, that's a good question. I, I've not thought about that before. I, 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 I don't know. Um, I would think about the answer to the question through the lens of executive functioning. So I've got three teenagers, so executive functioning and, and just the ability to like stay focused and do what you're supposed to do is sort of front and center in the Portnoy household. Um, I, I think there are, you know, some people who are um, calmer and uh, more disposed toward planning and probably don't need um, much, if any, help to kind of stay uh, calm and, and, and stay on the plan versus those that are, um, you know, a little bit more volatile in the moment. I, I, I wouldn't know how to think about the numbers. I mean, these are just sort of very generic personality types. I'm, I'm referring to, um, but, you know, part of what advisors and educators and coaches should do and what people might want to do on their own is evaluate, you know, sort of what, what is the nature of someone like, you know, are they more spontaneous? Are they more of a planning, um, have more of a planning mindset? And then, you know, neither is right or wrong. I, I, it's not an area for judgment. We're just, you know, born the way we are. I mean, in the same way that I like the color blue, I, I, more than the color orange, I might be more planning oriented than spontaneous. I, I don't know, it's just who I am. Um, you know, knowing yourself is the key to being a good investor and generally to uh, being um, good with money. Howard Marks, again, one of my heroes who's written about this, he said, you know, anybody that wants to be a great investor and wants to manage money really well, the one d degree they have, should have, is not in finance, but in psychology. One of, the, one of the things that's so tricky for people, I think, and, and this crisis has been no different, is that even if you have the right plan and even if you thought about the things that you were just talking about, to make sure you're taking a, an appropriate amount of uh, volatility risk on, is that every crisis is so different. Mm -hmm. And this one's such a good example. Makes, I, it, makes it hard. Um yeah, you know, in some circles, you're you're never supposed to say this time is different because we're all supposed to be students of history and, oh, yeah, you know, this is repeating patterns we've seen since the Roman era. I, I think that's a bunch of hooey. I think it's always different. Um, you know, hi his history uh, doesn't repeat, but people do. I mean, hu human nature is somewhat unflappable. Um, we respond to incentives um, and internal and external factors in, in, in certain ways. And so, you know, think about the last 20 years, you, you have the COVID crisis, you had the GFC, you had the tech meltdown, and so on and so on, all the way back through history. You, you know, to say generically that the market went down 20 or 27.4% or whatever your precise number is, tells you nothing about the nature of um, the, the threat or the, the perception of threat. And in addition, things are always different because we as human beings who get sort of one ticket for the merry-go-round, we're all experiencing this for the first time. So we need to figure it out. Um, it's not like, you know, we spend 100 years reading all of history and say, oh, okay, I get the patterns. Now let my life begin. Like we're living life in real time. Um, and uh, there are better or worse things that we can do to, to plan for things that we can't anticipate. Um, but let's not forget, you know, the, the, a lot of the joy in life comes from its uncertainty, the ability to explore and discover and be on an adventure. Um, the downside of that is sometimes things don't go well um, and we need to respond and we need to adapt. One of the things that we've said on this podcast a couple of times and once recently 
um, that I know you disagree with is that volatility is not a great measure of risk for a long-term investor. C- can you explain why we're wrong on that or why you don't agree anyway? You're so wrong. Let's have a, <laughs> let's have a screaming argument. No, I, I, um, I, 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 I you, you listen to Warren Buffett and other investing luminaries, and they will say that volatility is not risk because you're effectively at any moment marking to market some stock or portfolio that you own, but the loss isn't quote unquote real because you haven't sold anything. Like, you know, on paper it's less, but if you've got a long enough time horizon, you know, and, and you've done your work and you've made some, you know, intelligent choices, then, you know, it's going, it's going to be fine. And so volatility to some investors, many investors is considered to be just noise. I come at it from a completely different perspective, which is that um, uh, the behavioral investor responds to um, greed and fear on a, a daily basis. And if they are, Unfortunately, looking at the market every day, they, they've got countless opportunities to make many bad decisions. Um, if um, uh, we generally buy high and sell low, the opposite of what we're supposed to do based on that survival fight versus flight mentality, then when the market goes down, we tend to sell. Okay, should we sell? No, or at least probably not. Do many of us sell? Absolutely. If I look at... Um, you know, flows, at least in the, you know, data from the U.S. mutual fund uh, industry, which is massive, um, you know, 2007, 2008 forward, uh, what happened? The market went down 50 plus percent, the equity market, and investors uh, sprinted away from their investments. They, they sold and they went to cash. Well, what happened? Starting in March of 2009, the market took off, and over the course of a decade, it went up, you know, four, five hundred percent plus, and a, and a good chunk of those gains were made um, in those first few years. If you look at the data from the Investment Co- Company Institute, however, just kind of quarterly and annual fund flows, you'll see that um, um, you'll see that. Um, uh, uh, flows, positive flows back into uh, mutual funds, equity mutual funds, didn't turn positive until 2014. Wow. Okay. So um, you've got a phenomenon where people sell during volatility when they shouldn't and buy when things uh, get calm. How, how many clients do you have? How many people do I know who say, you know what? I just want the market to come back a little bit more and I'll feel more comfortable getting in. And all they're doing is foregoing gains. And when we listen to brilliant people, I mean, and I'm not being sarcastic, genuinely brilliant people like Howard Marks and Charlie Munger and um, Warren Buffett and, and these sorts of people, they're playing a very different game. They are accumulating more. They've got massive pools of capital. Remember, the, the game here for us, and it's not a game, but it's what we're trying to do, is goals-based investing. And so when volatility hits and people sell, they're less likely to hit their goals. So QED, volatility equals risk. It's good. Yeah. Can't disagree. It's worth, yep. a, it's worth a shot. <laughs> So in your book, you talk about adaptive simplicity. You talk about what that is and why it's so important in financial planning. I think there's a very fascinating debate right now in our lives generally about complex versus simple. And um, stepping back, we've never had, as humans, had to process more information and more choice than at any point before in recorded history, okay? And we can, you know, talk about, you know, the paradox of choice where the more and more choice that you get, um, the more miserable will you become. And there's an informational uh, analogy, which is that the more and more information that you accumulate, the more decisions you want to make. But the more decisions that you, want, that you make, the chance of, 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 of messing up. So simplicity is in, right? You know, just on the residential world, think about Marie Kondo and, and, and her glorious world of tidying up, 
all anybody's doing these days, it seems, is cleaning their closets, which I guess if you're stuck at home for two months, it's all you have to do anyway. But, you know, we're, we're in a world of tidying up. And so I think in that vein, complexity as, is, is seen as a, you know, complexity good, simplicity bad. And, and I would put a slightly different spin on it, which is to say that life's rich pageant comes through complexity. All right, so the, the, the messiness of life, um, the relationships that we have, um, the stories that we tell, um, th they are complicated and they are fun to engage with and, and, and figure out. And, and a lot of the things that we want to do in this world, like uh, build bridges and rocket ships to the moon and supercomputers, like that's all complex and, and there's skill and there's joy in, in pushing that forward. So complex, actually pretty good thing um, because it helps us solve big problems. Uh, simplicity, good, I think intuitively because it just feels like we've got things figured out. Adaptive simplicity is simply the notion that um, we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, you know, the most overused phrase of all time is that everyone gets punched in the face and, you know, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. Um, even though it's overused, I, I botched it. Um, and so we, um, we are constantly moving from complex to simple and there's something actually uh, constructive or joyful about that process. We don't know what's going to happen in life generally. We certainly don't know what's going to happen in the markets. Um, and so accepting that dynamic of not knowing what the future holds, and then on top of that, being open to rolling with the punches while we try to make sense of things, it is this notion of adaptive simplicity. And so as we move from circle, triangle, square, defining purpose, setting priorities, making decisions, having that adaptive mindset, I, I think is really empowering to people, more empowering than they, they might realize. Because once you accept that we don't know what's going to happen, and really nobody else has figured it out too, you have a wide space of license or permission to, 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 to go do your thing. So given that, that dichotomy between simplicity and complexity and, and the importance of being able to adapt, how do you think people should be thinking about setting financial goals, which are, I mean, kind of static? Aren't they? Yeah, and that's one of the problems with goal setting. Um, uh, you know, goals goals are a problem because um, well, goals are a very good thing. Without goals, um, we're probably in bad shape. Um, we just have to appreciate that there are um, some some wrinkles. You know, one being that when we achieve them, we tend not to be as happy as we think we're going to be. Another thing is that they change or maybe even completely re reverse. I I think. You know, and, and let's just talk about it in the context of financial planning. Uh, I think uh, a conversation between client and advisor that is explicitly uh, um, uh, uh, under the umbrella of uh, uh, adaptive thinking or adaptation is going to be more constructive and more fun. Um, let's just take retirement. It's the number one goal for, you know, most people in the Western world. Um, you know, retirement, uh, one way to spin it is that many of us develop our identity and social connections through work. And so what we want to do is accumulate enough money to stop doing what's meaningful to us. It, it, it's sort of a strange process. Um, you know, retirement wasn't a thing in the world until about 150, 200 years ago. So, um, you know, we have this goal of retirement and as you know, people age 55 or 60 or 65, what, whatever the, the number is, you know, in, in your circumstance, you know, as I meet with, talk with not only advisors, and, but, but clients, um, you know, a, a, a person or a couple will, will get to that age and they've done everything right in terms of um, uh, saving, you know, appropriately, making good investment decisions, not overspending, you know, all, all, the, all the basic stuff that we're supposed to do. Uh, and then you know, sort of a big, almost celebratory meeting. And the advisor says, you guys did it. You, 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 you've done everything right for the last 30 years to get to this point where now you can you know, do what you want. And increasingly, I hear from advisors as well as just regular people that the question then, and it's often, frankly, from the man um, in the relationship is what's next? 
okay, good. I'm, I'm glad we did this, but what's next? I got maybe, I hope, 30 years to go, um, or at least 25, and there's only so much golf I can play. And so when we sort of interrogate that um, retirement narrative and say that there's different ways to script all of that, we immediately uh, become ghostwriters um, for um, our client's authentic voice as they tell their story in pencil, not pen, because it's going to get erased and rewritten. So um, if we're just taking a standard financial plan and saying, hey, you know, look, we're all living the same vanilla script of I want to buy a house, I want to send my kids to college, I want to retire. First of all, that's what I want to do. Like, I'm not saying that's illegitimate. Of course, that's what you want to do. But recognizing that the scope and shape of those goals, as well as other things you haven't thought about, are going to emerge. And if you kind of introduce adaptation at the beginning of a relationship and say, we're going to try our best to prepare for what we know might happen, but there's going to be things that we don't anticipate and we're going to have to pivot. I think those relationships in a financial advice context go a lot better. So I have a question for the square part of your, your theory. So you've worked extensively in the hedge fund world for a long time, and you've talked about having thousands of manager interviews. So clearly you're an expert in that space, but the world of hedge funds believe that there's efficiencies that can be exploited over time. So based on your experience, do you think it's reasonable for investors to plan on or expect market beating returns? No. The answer is no. Um, for so many reasons. Um, one is most hedge funds don't aim to beat the market. Most, most hedge funds aim to deliver um, attractive risk adjusted returns. Hedge funds hedge. So let's just take the kind of basic case of the, the most common strategies, long short equity. Um, you, you're, you're long a bunch of stocks that you think are going to go up and you're short a bunch of stocks that you think are going to go down. And your so-called net exposure to the market is 50%. So um, someone gives you um, $100 and you buy $100 worth of stocks and you short $50 worth of stocks. So you have some leverage in the portfolio and um, your net market exposure, 100 minus 50, is, um, uh, is, is, uh, is 50. Well, what, what happens next? Well, you know, the, 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 the market happens and, and the market goes up and you have a number of stocks that are short, which means that they're going to be working against you while the stocks that you're long are going to work for you and all else equal, you know, the beta of that portfolio and, and you know, apologies because, you know, I, I don't want to get into jargon. Um, but the market exposure of, uh, uh, of the portfolio should suggest that when the market goes up, you're going to have some up capture. And when the market goes down, you're going to protect a little bit well. And so the original premise of, of hedge fund investing, and it's still to some extent the core proposition, is that um, you can achieve good returns for less risk or for any given unit of risk that you take, you can achieve more. Um, the challenge about talking about quote unquote hedge funds is that it's not an asset class it is a vast space filled with literally thousands of idiosyncratic firms trading every market on the planet. So whether it be equities or bonds or loans or commodities or derivatives, the, the, the important thing about getting involved with any form of complex investments, you know, and this gets back to the square, is um, what, what are my expectations here? And it very well might be worth it based on good due diligence that um, you think that uh, they're going to achieve whatever it is they say they're going to achieve. And one hedge fund manager say, might say, hey, we're looking to blow the market away. Okay, that's fine. And others might say, oh, no, we're just looking to make um, um, you know, a steady 5% over a cash hurdle or over LIBOR or something like that you got to ask all these questions to figure out what they're doing and then in turn ask yourself, okay, how does that particular piece fit into my portfolio? The key is ex ex expectations management. And I did have a career for 
more than 10 years in doing due diligence on hedge funds. And, and that was the name of the game. You, you, you read everything they write, you sit down and you do interviews, you, you do a bunch of quantitative analysis and ultimately conclude that there's enough of a program here with reliable expectations that I think it's going to be a good fit for me or for the client portfolio that I'm building. And would the same go for a typical active manager? I'm sorry? Would you expect a typical active manager to outperform the market? No, there's no evidence of that. I mean, um, the opposite is true. Um, if you if you look at um, any number of data sources, um, Standard & Poor's does a, an annual survey of this, but you know, you'll see that a, a majority, and in most cases, a, a large majority of active managers don't meet their uh, beat their style benchmark. So, you know, as an old Morningstar guy, the 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 style box is tattooed on you know virtually a, a tattooed on my forehead so think about large growth small value mid cap core whatever you know there's an enormous amount of data available now in each of those nine boxes um, in terms of you know large mid small cap growth value core um, something like eighty to ninety percent of uh, active managers over any rolling time period, one, three, five, ten 10 years, do not beat their benchmark. The, the hedge fund piece is interesting. Um, just the way that you were talking about it. it. Maybe it makes sense for some people in, in some cases or some institutions, entities, whatever it may be, if it aligns with their objectives. When, when we think about the, the typical individual who's trying to accumulate forward a retirement goal, mm -hmm. say, do, do, you think, do you think hedge funds have a role in that type of situation? There could be a role, but it, it, it's, it's at best limited. I, 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 I believe that to the extent that, you know, so-called alternative investments, so certain hedge fund strategies, as well as private equity and venture and, and certain, you know, credit strategies, um, in the context of an institutional portfolio that has the time and expertise to, to really be vigilant and to uh, appreciate the vicissitudes of what that portfolio is going to do and how the pieces relate to each other, it could make a lot of sense. And in fact, you know, we know that the, the quote unquote Yale endowment model, the, the David Swenson model going back 30 plus years um, you know, it was built on the idea that, you know, origin, it, it elaborated on the original portfolio theory from Markowitz from the late 1950s that said, um, you know, if you put together a, 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 a bunch of different investments that have a low correlation to each other, you get more for less. Uh, and so institutional investors on the back of the way Swenson wrote about endowment investing, they're doing that and there's trillions invested in hedge funds and that's all fine and good. As it relates to individuals, um, it so depends on the opportunity. So, you know, just to give, um, let me give two contrary examples and I'll be very brief. You have the long short equity uh, example where it's just sort of a trading instrument and the firm claims that they do better uh, research on, you know, small cap or mid cap stocks around the world and they're going to be long and they're going to be short. Uh, we can see a very mixed history of uh, whether those folks are able to achieve their um, uh, achieve their goals. And it does require a, a fair amount of vigilance to even know what they're doing. A, a second might be more of a structured uh, situation. So take structured credit where there's a real estate investment or a land investment or, or, or something that's going to generate some sort of income that's, a, that's not predictable, but there's something that you can do in understanding where you are in the capital stack and the security that's associated with that particular sliver of the capital stack that you're invested in. You can do deep due diligence there and say, okay, we are much more senior than the junior debt, let alone the equity, and there's something reliable about that. And in turn, I might be able to generate X percent a year you know, for myself or for, for, for my client portfolio. That very much could come in a hedge fund and a hedge fund is just a legal structure. It's a, it's a, it, it's a private partnership. There might be plenty of those that could be super appropriate for an income seeking investor, as long as they are comfortable with the complexity and in many cases, leverage and illiquidity. Yeah. Right. Um, maybe this next question kind of speaks to, uh, to an extent anyway, at least the expertise piece 
how do you think, again, talking about individuals who are accumulating for retirement or, or decumulating in retirement, how do you think that they should be thinking about the decision to employ or, or engage with a financial advisor or, or maybe a different way to ask the question? I'm going to ask it a different way. Yeah. How do you think someone should decide if they, sh- if they are equipped to manage their own investments and their own retirement plan? Something I underappreciated until a few years ago and now I, I think is about as important as anything in our industry is recognizing that there are two phases to the process of being an investor, accumulation and decumulation. I think that the accumulation phase, which is what really all of finance is built on, you know, if you think about Markowitz and Fama and French and all of the, you know, luminaries that have created sort of the investment complex that we, inve- you know, work through today, what Jack Bogle did with Vanguard, you, you name it. It's about accumulating assets. It's about more. There does come a point where for any number of reasons, we stop accumulating assets and we have to live off the cash flows of the assets that we have um, assembled over time. I think the latter is incredibly difficult. And it's only as I've kind of grown up in the industry and now hang out with lots of financial advisors and I myself, you know, with aging parents and growing kids and, uh, you know, moderately complicated life, you know, think about, well, what would it mean to create income from the assets I've accumulated. There, there's nothing in efficient markets theory or in portfolio theory or what David Swenson does at Yale that tells me how I should do that. At bare minimum, anyone who anticipates having to live off of their assets um, that they've accumulated over the first 30 or 40 years of their life should in some ways have a relationship with a financial advisor. It, it, it's just so difficult to figure out those cash flows on top of that, certain, you know, sort of insurance needs, um, at least in the States, health, you know, healthcare related insurance, incre- incredibly complicated. There are so many reasons, um, you know, for people to do that. I would, ar- so that's my base argument. If you're in the decumulation phase or going to be entering it in the next 10 or 15 years, having a partner that helps you think through what you need to do, super important. I think there's the next level, which is even during the accumulation stage, um, we do find from a lot of studies that people who work with advisors tend to have better investment outcomes um, than those who don't. And with respect to you guys and all of my advisor buddies, it's not because you're great investors. It's because you keep um, and, and you might be making, you know, building very intelligent portfolios that are, you know, spot on appropriate for who the client is. But the, the, the real um, juice in the squeeze here is that you help consistently can help people be avoid being the worst version of themselves at the worst possible times. And so that that intervention helping people envision a budget and cash flows, helping them avoid bad decision during volatile times, you know, to the point we, we made earlier about time collapsing during crises. It's just good to have help. Um, and I think um, on the back of that, many people who just think that this is an investment game and that you go to an advisor because he or she's going to build you a great portfolio, they're missing the good stuff. And the good stuff's only getting better because based on social psychology, decision theory, neuroscience, neurobiology, and so forth, we now know more and more and more about better decision making. And among other things, the fact that it, it takes a certain skill to turn a good decision into a good habit. I don't decide every day to brush my teeth. I just brush my teeth. It's a habit. There are ways to do that with money life that a lot of people, most people haven't mastered. Those who work with an advisor are much more likely to not only make good decisions, but to form good habits. Okay, so someone decides they want to work with an advisor, they want to get the good stuff. What's your practical advice for someone who's going out to a very complicated marketplace that we all work in? Yeah. What do you tell that person that comes to you and says, Brian, what's, what's the checklist? What should I be looking for to get the good stuff? Yeah. Um, I mean, Cameron, I, I, wish, I wish I had a, a good answer. For that, I, I think it's a it's a super legitimate and and hard question. I guess one way I'd think about it is to replace the word advisor with coach, and maybe think of this through a, a, a coaching framework. 
and then create an analogy with our physical fitness. So I don't think many of us are um, averse to getting in shape and maybe working with, you know, someone who can help, uh, you know, encourage us or show us how to exercise in the right way. And, but on top of that instruction, keep us disciplined. Like, Hey, we're meeting in the park at 6 AM and you're going to, you're going to run around. Um, we can all imagine that, the, you know, the personality of that coach is going to gel with us or not. Maybe we want somebody who's stern, uh, a military sergeant type. Maybe we want someone who's just, you know, softer and more encouraging. Um, we also want to have a sense of the type of people they've helped in the past. Um, you know, so I, you know, I'd find a guy, you know, or, or a gal that maybe has experience helping people, you know, sort of chubby 50 year old guys that would like to be slightly less chubby, you know, so ha have you worked with people like me? Um, well, just port that back into the financial advice or financial wellness and coaching space, which is how does this feel? Because it's going to be a relationship. We're going to end up sharing things with our advisors that we probably don't even share with our husband or wife at times. And so is, is there a comfort level here? Um, there, I guess there are ways to, to think about skill, um, you know, through the lens of experience. Um, but really, you know, that personality fit and, hey, have you helped other people like me in the past? Tell me how that went. What went right? What might have got wrong? How are you better now than you were in the past? Um, do you see anything specific about how you would coach me that might be different? than other, um, other people that would be in my cohort. Um, I, love the, I, I love the question because there is such a supermarket or marketplace of solutions out there. Uh, it, it's unbelievably o overwhelming. And, um, you know, again, to one of the most influential books in, in my career, The Paradox of Choice, the more choice we, we get, the more miserable we become. And we also have something called decision fatigue, um, as well as choice paralysis. So you, you, you just, you're, you're staring, you're at the market, there's, there's, uh, you know, a uh, hundred different types of breakfast cereal. And you're like, I, I, I don't know what I want. I, you just walk away, you don't even buy the cereal. So let's, let's look on the other end. You said that one of the biggest questions that people have is, am I going to be okay? Mm -hmm. So is our industry doing a pretty good job of helping people keep the answer to that question? Yes. I think the answer is mixed. Um, I think that the parts of the industry and the, the good news is that this part of the industry from, from where I sit is, is growing rapidly that engages not only in goals based planning, but embraces a more holistic coaching approach, which isn't to say that it's squishy or that it's therapy, but like you, you really try to help people in their money life, which is, which is all encompassing. And it's not just about a portfolio, a, you know, a goals targeted portfolio that's growing like a weed. Um, more and more people are turning to that, you know, in every industry, in the history of capitalism, competition and technology um, puts people out of business. And, you know, mo most people in our industry, hey, is capitalism a good thing or a bad thing? A lot of people say, yeah, it's a good thing. But then you have to accept that we have this process of creative destruction where there are going to be solutions from the bottom up that come up and basically make what you do, your your formal, you know, specialty with a moat. Now it's just a commodity. Um, and so um, I, I think getting people to... Um, recognize that is is critically important it ends up being about um delivering experience i think we had we had dennis mosey williams on the podcast who i think you know uh yep, know a while well. ago he, yep. he talked a lot about the well he talked all about the experience economy and that that whole concept i think you hit the nail on the head perfectly you know in one of the things you said earlier uh, in this part of the conversation where you made that you you differentiated investment management from financial the the broader picture of financial mm -hmm. advice, and I think that's one of the pieces that investors, the end investors, get wrong. That they when you go out to get investment advice, it it shouldn't necessarily just be it, it shouldn't just be about the portfolio. Mm -hmm. You know, 
one of the things about me and and the two of you and probably a lot of people we hang out with is that we're pretty excited about this industry because in a world of endless noise and complexity, we're pretty well positioned to just help people do better. Um, sometimes I forget that number one, people don't know and they don't care. And also the industry has changed so quickly that it wasn't that long ago that we were all just sort of stockbrokers, you know, just buying and selling stocks. Like there was no E-Trade or, or, or Schwab, you know, that, that came around like in the nineties. Um, it, just not that long ago, this was an industry that sold securities and other investment products to people, period. There was no plan. Um, so then planning came around and now coaching is coming around. There's a bur small but burgeoning field of financial therapy. There's all these green shoots in a larger global push toward wellness. And because money, you know, coming all the way to the beginning, why, you know, Lord Voldemort, you know, we, we, we don't want to talk about it. We don't want to, you know, in, in envision this, this dangerous, you know, this, this, this dangerous thing. It, it's totally legitimate to think about our emotional wellness, our physical wellness, and so forth. But wellness related to money, it's still taboo um, in, in many circles. Um, I'm sure you have conversations with clients where sometimes they just don't want to go there, but you know the right answer is somewhere where they don't want to go. I, I have those conversations with with, with, with people as well. So um, I think it's on us to articulate a constructive, um, uh, a constructive vision for what financial advice can be that combines both rigorous planning, skills-based, requires years of experience and training, while at the same time demonstrating empathy. And not just squishy, oh, it's going to be okay, but like there's a way to listen to people. Active listening is a skill. So if you combine rigor and empathy together, you're, you know, we're all in a position to do great things for people, but um, most of the work remains to be done. And you're doing some of it now, and you mentioned green shoots, and I think that you are one of those at the moment uh, within our industry. Can you talk a little bit about your current venture, Shaping Wealth? Yeah, sure. So it's a relatively new firm, um, but one that I've been thinking about for many years. I mean, I've been on my journey in this industry for more than two decades. And, you know, my evolution was really, hey, it's all about investments and picking good fund managers and building better portfolios. And two things happened. Number one, I, I learned something, um, may, maybe a little bit more than something about the way the investment business works and where we can find skill versus, you know, just people who are lucky or in the right market at the right time. And then, you know, I'm 20 years older. Again, I've got three teenage kids, a, a wife, my, my parents are getting older. There's, there's a lot going on that I think about and I want to be helpful for and just kind of sort out in my own mind. The Geometry of Wealth, you know, which came out in 2018, you know, was sort of a, you know, dual, dual project. Um, you know, I, I don't know if it counts as a midlife crisis or anything, but like writing the book helped me sort through some stuff in my mind. And I think through the lens of funded contentment about what I want in, in, in my own life, but it also at the same time reflected, you know, where I think the wealth management industry in the broadest definition was, is, and is going. So I launched a firm that um, is going to sort of put these mental models that we've been talking about today into motion for different audiences that I hope will find them helpful. First and foremost, that's, you know, wealth management platforms, financial advisors. Uh, there's a big uptick granted from a small base in corporate financial wellness programs. Again, that's becoming more legitimate, you know, helping people be healthy or have a helpline if they're stressed or depressed or anxious, like that's been around for a long time, helping people, you know, understand their own money lives relatively new. And then third, um, I'm already very active um, in the financial literacy, uh, youth financial literacy. And so just, you know, as a volunteer, effort for some years now, and I, I have a number of things I want to do with others, is to um, 
structure a way for not just kids, but kids with their parents and families to have better conversations about all of this stuff. Uh, because I, I honestly believe that um, folks can end up in a much better place if they're taught early on that money is not Lord Voldemort, that money is something that we can approach and that we can talk about, while at the same time acknowledging that it makes us nervous for a reason. So our last question, and I realize you may have answered part of it in the last response. How do you define success in your own life? Um, I. I really do use funded contentment uh, as, as a tool to, to think about things. And, um, you know, on the contentment part, um, and, and, you know, Cameron, you were nice enough to, to read the book. You know, there's, there's, there's four parts to that. Um, I call it the four C's, connection, uh, control, uh, context, and uh, competence. And, um, you know, in brief, that means that we are social beings and our social relationships mean so much to us. Um, we value control or autonomy and self-determination. Competence, we get so much of our identity from work or hobby or vocation. And then finally, context, you know, that sense that you're living for something beyond yourself, not just your family, but a bigger idea, your country, your religion, um, your sports team, wh whatever it might be. Um, I've been pretty intentional just in the last three or four years as I've been kind of working on this project and writing a lot, not, and not just publicly, but journaling uh, for myself, of taking those four uh, underlying sources of meaning and, and really thinking at times, well, am I living up to those um, uh, standards? Are, am, I, am, I, am I diving into those areas of living a meaningful life in a way that I can? And you know, recognizing that whether we like it or not, money figures into all of this, um, at minimum putting a, a roof over your head and food on the table. And so trying to sync it all up. So honestly, um, the geometry of wealth, the circle, triangle, square, that's, that's my personal mental model for living a good life. Um, and, um, you know, I've, I've shared it with people and hopefully they, they find it helpful. Well, Brian, thanks so much for sharing time with us. This has been a, frankly, a sensational interview. And I'm not surprised because I love, absolutely love Geometry Book. It's a phenomenal book. So thanks so much for, for joining us today. It's my pleasure. It's a great conversation, guys. And uh, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Brian.